Okay. Woo! I'm about to. I'm Let's actually alright because I decided I was meant to go get feed after the interview, but I decided that actually I had time to go before. Ah, so you're good. So it's actually worked out really well. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm very sorry. That's alright. I've got, um, I was telling... We had to eat half the biscuits before you got here. Yeah. I was telling you, I've got, you're um, <laughs> yeah, I've got, like, rats that have got chisels in my yard that really like the taste of Bailey's Endurance Mix. Mm. But they it gnawed through amazing. the top of my bin that has my feed Your in. Your plastic bin? Plastic bin. Oh my god. Two plastic bins because I moved it and then took the feeds out. So I've changed, A, changed my feed because I found a cheaper one. It's mm. probably just as good. And I don't know what I'm going to do now. I'm hoping I don't like it. We've got... I know, uh, but they're really expensive. Dad's got, Dad's got a mess with us bin that he's had a, a, a kind of a arms race with the squirrels on. Because, <laughs> so he had the metal dustbin that he put the bird feed in. And then they were lifting the yeah. lid off and getting it off. So he put a rod through. So it goes from one yes. side of the lid. I through. have that in my chicken run so, across the top of us. Yeah. But then they were shimming the rod along <laughs> and getting it out. But they were always doing it one way. So we put a clip on that side. And then they were shimming it out the other <laughs> <laughs> so that's got a clip on both sides. Um, it's bungee elastic. You can hook it through one side of the handle, over the lid on the top, around the other side. Dad, <laughs> if you're listening. So or what they did when I was at Broadlands was they had they plaited some baler twine. Yeah, yeah, and did the same. They were always plaiting the top. Plaiting yeah. baler twine. Always. I worked at Broadlands a while ago now. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped when I was pregnant with my first child because I could no longer bend over to muck out without wanting to be sick. And she's nearly eight. So it's been a while since I worked in mm. Portland, but I, I still plait bits of bear twine. Mm. I find them in my coat pockets mm. at the end of the winter. I'm like, oh, I can catch a pony. Mm. Perfect. Yep. Especially the miniature Shetland, who is very sly on the There's catching a... front. The approach on his blind side. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason Shetlands have the other nickname that everyone gives them. Yes, which I'm guessing we can't say because it's a child-friendly podcast. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. However, the miniature Shetland is adorable. That's all that matters. He's a one-eyed miniature Shetland called Norman. I'm going to buy him a clip-on parrot so he can be a pirate pony. I love there's there's something about animals with like suburban human names that I love so much. Like one of Nick's horses is called Helen. I love Helen because it's a horse called Helen. Yeah. I love it so much. And then uh, a friend of a friend has a Shetland called Dave. <laughs> love that. There's another one called Derek. Derek the Shetland. I think it's the funniest thing. <laughs> we once had Del Boy when my little sister was small. Oh, he so really nice. was a bit of a. I know a Del Boy in Woking Pony Club. Yeah, but he's actually. Anyway, anyway so back to part two of our interview with Saz <coughs> a Holistic Solution. And she's going to talk to us today about her trip to America that she took in the summer. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So yeah. what made you decide to go to America? Yeah. Because um, there are classical dressers trainers in the UK. <laughs> it's true, but I've never picked the easy path in life. I like the long distance one. And that's um, where you get to go to America. Well, and this was my third trip to America. Mm. Five years ago, I persuaded my family to come with me for a week long, once in a lifetime in <laughs> with these guys in America. Um, I guess I've been training with them at clinics over here and online for two years by that point. And mm. I was like, come on, like we've had the second baby. Let's just go before we have to pay for his, him to have a full seat. It'll be amazing. And I'll never want to do it again. I promise that'll be it. <laughs> and that's like with a baby, it's going to be just, just great. It was just only great. nine hours and a two-year-old. It was amazing. Yeah, absolutely fine. Um, I mean, I was having to do lessons. That's when you until, need the cowpole. <laughs> well, I was doing lessons until the baby was hungry, then stopping to feed him in February in Washington State, where it's as cold and grim as it is here. And then back on the horse and then feed the baby again. It was Mad. <laughs> yes, uh, it has mental. been mentioned that maybe I'm a little mental. <laughs> um, the reason that I train with these guys in America is because they teach this particular pre pre French Revolution, mm -hmm. pre military riding. I mean, it was military riding. All the guys who were doing it were noblemen, so mm. their sons were you know becoming admirals, yeah. or whatever it is for the land based yeah. cavalry version. But the equitation that they teach is from this golden age of equitation. So. Mm. Young men were sent to learn it because it taught them to be ethical leaders who made just decisions, mm. who could understand with compassion and with gentleness and with kindness. Could Not communicate better. Way better. They just became mm. better military leaders mm. because of it. And it enabled them to keep their horses, if, like, even further back in time when you're in a besieged castle, mm. it taught you how to train your horse within. I mean, Boshe says you can train a horse to do everything in a 12 by 14 stable, um, including flying changes, pirouettes, mm. the works. So it was that that ability to train a horse in a really precise mm. way. They're called the National School of Academic Equitation and mm. it's because Craig Stevens, the guy who founded it, he 
goes back and he translates old French texts. So it's mm. it's knowledge about equitation that as English speakers we don't have access to. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason I got more heavily involved with them is because I, I, I would love to speak French fluently, but I speak French pretty well. Um, that's <laughs> <laughs> as good as they tingle our emails from oh, I got like an excited I got an excited text like I said it to my friend to translate but I worked out <laughs> so I'm basically bilingual <laughs> so I've been helping with editing some of his translations because he translates wonderfully into what I like to call Craiglish mm-hmm. and then I translate from Craiglish to English so mm-hmm. that other people can read it too because <laughs> it's, it's pretty technical reading a lot mm-hmm. of it um, so yes they're the only people that I found that teach that way and they've only qualified three people to teach as their instructors worldwide. Yeah. Anneli is in Sweden, I am here, and Megan is in Colorado. So kind of, I've got to fly wherever I'm going to go. Yeah. Um, and there they have a place with 18 school horses. Yeah. It's nice. Isn't it? it's, it's pretty cool. So yeah, so I went that first time, and then two years ago I went for two weeks, which was about as long as I could get away from the kids from. Mm. And I kept on saying, I really want to go and do their professional school. So mm. I really do, but that's a year in America. Mm. Taking a year mm. out of a life where you and your husband are both self-employed and you yeah. have two small kids in school it's, it's technically impossible it's a lot, yeah. so instead I left two weeks before the summer holidays started and then the kids mm. and the family came out for most of the summer holidays mm. and then I stayed for an extra three weeks after they left mm. and rammed in nearly 11 weeks worth of intensive training oh my god and it was properly intensive I was doing mm. six days a week while the kids were there and working a 12 day week when the kids weren't there 12 days is the longest I can go before I actually need a day off I've discovered mm. which shows me how old I'm getting like, at yeah. one point, I would have just worked non-stop. <laughs> I mean, I did that at the start of the summer. It's not that fun. Like, I managed it, mm. but mm, yeah. it wasn't that fun. I mean, the thing is, though, is that I, I loved the work. I mm. loved the teaching. I loved the training. I loved working with the horses. I started out just riding the school, like, the really well-schooled school mm. horses. And then as I got better, um, was then riding some of the young horses they had mm. coming up, which was... I really like baby horses. So I love really baby cool. horses. I always think... Like, we, we were talking about how it... Like, it really helps with communication. I always think anyone who wants to go into a leadership position should break in a horse because Definitely. it's uh, when I was doing it, it was a real kind of like it's a real kind of like oh god moment when you realize that like you start off and you're like oh yeah, I can do this, like, I can ride a horse, this will be fine. And then you realize that like they don't stop when you put on the reins and you're suddenly like oh my god. <laughs> yes, that's been the thing for me is realizing there are like a million and one things that a horse yeah. doesn't know that yeah. you yes. didn't realize. And you can't, like you're kind of like oh yeah, I know I can't explain it to all horses don't speak English. Haha, of course I can do this and then you're like oh, but there's so much of a language that you have with horses that they don't understand and you have to try and teach it to them. What again with why the classical works so amazing yeah. because it's a it's a ta- we learn the tactile language of space that mm. horses use. Yeah. Um because they're never going to speak English. They don't mm. even have the right jaw. Um, <laughs> so it makes much more sense for us to engage our enormous brains mm. and learn to speak in touch. But actually for people to come out of a linguistic mode mm. of talking and mm-hmm. learn to use space and touch, mm. is it does wonderful things to the people while yeah. they're doing it. Which is and be work. that like receptive mm. to something else. I have to say, I know my uncatchable horse keeps coming up into these podcasts, but <laughs> she has actually taught me about the space. Yeah. Because... I can feel when I go to catch her, there's like a bubble of space around me. Mm. And if I move that bubble towards her and she's not ready to be caught, she moves away. But if she decides she wants to come into my bubble, I can feel when she's crossed the line line, and she's like, oh yeah, I'll come in now. I can Mm. just like read her body language. So Mm. there's, like everyone knows about the fight and the flight zones. Mm. But there's another zone that's not quite so well known about, which is the zone of recognition, which mm. is the point at which the f- horse first notices you. And on like a really comfortable horse that you've been around forever, it might be as close as like a meter up to it. But mm. they're like, oh, hello, mm. you're here. I was just eating. Mm. But in America, we had this wonderful Mustang called Washo, who had been the things that people do to horses, mm. sat on to get a head collar on, you know, properly terrified. And he taught me so much about catching uncatchable horses because you can learn to play that space with her mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so as she starts to move forwards out of it you can just kind of like dance the edges of it yeah um you just find i like to call it like the working surface mm-hmm. and sometimes the working surface is 10 foot away from them sometimes it's mm-hmm. 10 meters and how to kind of play with that space to a point where you're moving harmoniously mm-hmm. and then you can start to go into the space a little more mm. yes. i found i was i was explaining it to someone because i like i'm used to big horses like it takes quite a lot to like to for me to feel like physically intimidated by something and my, mm. I was like but you deal with like they're big animals like how are you like 
how do you know when like when they're going to be aggressive or whatever and you're like you just you just kind of know like sometimes they'll look at you one way and you'll be like oh no this is fine I can stand up to you yeah. and then sometimes they'll look at you and you'll be like I'm just gonna back quietly out of the room <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I mean there's that psychosensual mm. sense that people have that's not always recognized in mainstream culture mm. but people can feel what's going on yeah. at a level that they don't necessarily recognize yeah. but like you can always tell when somebody's pissed off, annoyed with you. Um, sorry, That's right, I can take it out. <laughs> you can, you, people sense a lot more yeah. than they notice that they're sensing. Yeah, and it's not like you can be like, oh yeah, just when they're angry, they have both ears pinned back. Like, it's a lot more subtle than that. It's way more subtle than that. And the more time you spend with them being open to the possibility mm. that they're as emotionally intelligent as we are, mm. mm-hmm. the more you notice. Mm-hmm. I have got given these two lovely Irish sports horses who mm. had never been mistreated intentionally they'd been handled in a very conventional sense yeah um but now they're with me and where they have much more options mm. i i am not somebody who's going to let my horse or my child run out into a road because i'm going to say oh no i never say no mm. um there's firm boundaries but there's mm. a lot of space within those boundaries mm. and i was lunging her for the first time and she bronked like this was just before the first time i was going to sit mm. on her she's been ridden lots but not in two or three years mm. so, oh, i will just will work you on the land we'll put the stirrups down we'll let them flap mm. and she bronked and bronked and bronked and i was going oh gosh i'm not sure i want to sit on you <laughs> and then she ran backwards to the end of the lunge line and she just stood there going mm. now is the bit where you tell me off and i was like no no it's fine love mm. just trot on we'll be good mm. and she just looked at me like oh, oh that's that's very different mm. and suddenly she's more engaged and like well, what is this crazy human gonna do <laughs> like, what else what else can i do and she's gonna say that was lovely beautiful i love seeing all four of your feet mm. off the floor that's great. <laughs> let's go yeah. um, so how um you said how long you were out in america for yes what were you hoping to gain from your time there and the experience uh, i went there specifically with the goal of being good enough that they would award me my credential as a rider a trainer and an instructor and that's what i did Cool. Very good. Oh, I'm I'm a pretty goal oriented person. If I decide I'm going to do something, it's going to happen, yeah, <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> so, give us like an overview of your time and like all the training that you received there. So, it sounds like going to be a long. Time. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure I can make it pretty short. Um, I was teaching lessons to people starting straight out mm. who'd never sat on a horse before, to oh people God. who'd been riding that way for longer than I had, and the people, the people in between. Mm. Um, my mentor got really sick, so at one point I was also managing the barn and training the new wow. staff, which was cool. It's only like 18 horses there. It's Nothing. Fine. It's fine. Um, I had horses that were mine that they'd given me specific things that they want the horse to learn over the mm. summer, so I was training those horses. I was keeping the school horses. Taking over. Well, yeah, taking over because they get ridden by a lot of people who are mm. learning, so it's really important for their mental and their physical health that they mm. get ridden by somebody who... What claims doing. they know what they're doing mm. um, so that they can find that balance again and remember mm. how to have a conversation with a yeah. human um, so that they've then got that generosity of spirit to do it again with the students and yeah mm. I was there at 8 o'clock in the morning I was leaving at 4, 5 or 6 in the evening mm. doing everything between lots of getting horses in and out lots of watching my mentors ride mm. and then having lessons with them you get like a certain number of actual lessons each week but then mm. you also as you're taking a horse in, you're like, I was watching you do this and I want to ask you about mm. how was it that you had the horse, you know, mm. in a wrong there, in canter, but then changed the bend and it was all absolutely fine. Mm. Um, and then you suddenly find yourself getting a 20 minute mini lesson, which is... Mm. Sneaky. The more questions, <laughs> well, no, they, they actively encourage it. They're like, <coughs> bring your questions, mm. like ask and ask and ask. So I did. Mm. First, book, first thing about working for Harry Mead, Harry's really like detail orientated. I yeah. don't think he listens to this, but he's very, very detail oriented. So anytime I spent alone with him, I was like, oh, what's this? And then you get 20 minutes later. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and what's this? And another 20 minutes. It's just, yeah, exactly. It's amazing. I've mm. got to make the most of people with yeah. that much experience. Yeah, exactly. I have I'm a little bit of that with pony care, mm. as people who listen <laughs> probably. And the other day, I was asked to do a lecture for <laughs> the apprentices where I'm working. Yeah. And I was like, oh, cool, what are we doing? And they gave me this list, and I was like, we can't do that in an hour. Like, that we need, like, three hours mm. to yeah. cover that. And they kind of looked at me like, but we always get it done in an hour. And I was like, oh, well, you've got to do a confirmation <laughs> assessment. You've got to do foot balance. You've got to do different types of clipping. And you've got pictures of the horse's internal systems to label. We yeah. cannot do that in an hour. Definitely. And by the time I'd done a bit on foot balance and we'd found a horse and we'd done like how to do a confirmation assessment and we'd talked through like how it all affects, mm. it was an hour. Yeah. Mm. And I was like, Easy. 
you're going to have to look the rest up in a book because mm. <laughs> the rest is all doable in a book but we can't do confirmation in a book because no. that's not doable I love doing confirmation because my horse is really, my horse and the horses we have in the yard are all really odd confirmation so yeah. my horse has a wonky pelvis so I love doing confirmation because it means people come out and they're like oh yeah she looks like this and I'm like mm, but have you checked the other side because she's got a hip bone on one side and she doesn't have it on the oh, other she's missing one on the other side yeah oh, I've got, I got told by a nutritionist who fat scored her at a competition she'd just gone around badminton grassroots when she was five and she was a amazing she was super fit finished the course like she could have gone again and we went and got her fat scored by the nutritionists who were there and I won't say who they came from but um she stood on one side and she's like mm, you know she's looking a bit on the fat side you know she's actually scoring as obese and all of this and I was like I can see her side. ribs <laughs> like, yeah. she's not okay and then I was just like oh just just check the other side and she came around she was like oh she looks really fit and I was like yeah it's because her pelvis is shunted to the left so one side she's got a really prominent hip bone and the other side it's just flat I like working with horses with dodgy confirmation though just because as a trainer like taking a perfectly square warm blood and getting Mm. it to look fancy down the centre line is not that complicated Mm. taking somebody's backyard bred Arab Mm. that has been rammed in draw reins to go shoving Mm. and then convincing it that it could telescope its neck and it could stretch and it could Mm. all be okay Mm -hmm. is it's so much more satisfying yeah so much more satisfying I found it's really because uh, I always was like, oh, my horse is never going to be straight because she has this wonky pelvis and she's never going to be straight. So I work really hard on it. And then um, I now ride other people's horses and I'm like, you have no excuse. <laughs> like, mine has an excuse for not being straight. <laughs> this. So, going back on topic. <laughs> Sorry, back on topic. Um, next one's a, what's a question that you put in because yes. you've had some input into these I questions did, yes. so we could get the most out of it because I didn't really know what you've been up to on <laughs> Instagram. Um, what's the difference between a cue and an aid? So this is the fundamental thing about the way that I teach, which I love so much. Because I've done, I've trained with lots of other people who teach classical work because mm. I, I like to dip my fingers in all of the pies and then take all of the bits that I like the most mm. and mm-hmm. that fit for me. But an aid is... A sensation that you can input into a horse's body which reminds them of a feeling that they have felt before Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for example trot is a really square gait Mm. you've got two diagonal pairs you're moving really square so what I need the horse to do in order to ask it to trot is to become square and then have that feeling of impulsion and Mm. then the horse goes oh I'm square and I'm moving forward I must be trotting Mm. or I'm square and I'm not feeling a need to move forward therefore I must be stopping Mm. or I'm square and you're still asking me to move but not to go forward therefore I am piaffing Mm. it becomes really simple rather than the cues that we have learned which is push horse forwards Mm. and it will eventually trot it's Mm. it's a sensation that actually has meaning to the horse and therefore the Mm. conversation can be so much finer Ah. Yeah, so f- like an ex- a great example of a cue is when you have a specific thing that you do when you're mounting them. Mm. Some people like teach them that when I tap you on your bottom, it means that you move your bottom round. Mm. That's a learnt response. I do this, you do that, rather than I cause the feeling to arise in your body that means you go, oh, I'm moving. Mm. It's so, a shame that you guys are listening because you can't see my hands, which are doing all sorts of <laughs> majesticulatory talker. We talked in the last episode about how you do many things from body working through to coaching. Why do you do both body working and coaching? Like, why not just do one? I do them both at the same time. <laughs> because I want the the horse to be comfortable so that's where I started as a body worker and then the horse also has to learn to move better Mm. in order to maintain the comfort because if they move badly I mean it's like putting a badly fitting saddle on a horse Mm. there's no point in getting the horse's back fixed if you haven't fixed the saddle so Mm. there's no point in horsing getting the horse comfortable if you don't change the way that it then moves Mm. and uh, I'd love to have some clients who could pay me to come out five days a week to train the horses for them Mm. if you're out there please (laughs) (laughs) but uh, failing that it's much more empowering to teach the owners how to be able to move their horses better so Mm. basically it's just for me it's it's part of making horses more comfortable is teaching the people to ride them better or to handle them better or teaching them that in hand work exists and is a thing they should do every day Mm. Um, Um, is classical dressage just for people who want to do competitive dressage no it's for everyone (laughs) I barely want to do competitive dressage because I'm terrified of the warm-up arenas Um, (laughs) that's fair enough I am (laughs) I've got to get over this that's this winter's project is get over my fear of warm-up arenas no classical dressage is for everyone Mm. classical dressage I mean it's called that now but it used to just be called dressage is French for training it was Mm. just horse training you trained yours because you wanted it to be able to take you to market you wanted it to be able to carry you to war you wanted Mm. it to take you out hunting and to the 
promenade to mm. look really fancy. So it's just horse training. If a horse is square and balanced and mentally engaged, then it lasts longer and therefore it's worth the investment in the time mm. when it was your only mode of transport. So yeah, classical dressage is for everyone. Um, what qualifications are you working towards now within your coaching and within your um, like body work and that sort of thing? Uh, I'm taking a minor, like, week-long break from training and thing. Well, until Monday when I go and do my safeguarding course. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really long break. Yeah. I'm a compulsive learner. But, top tip, once you've done your face-to-face safeguarding course, yes. you can uh, renew it online. Oh, perfect. Mm. Um, as soon as they publish the dates, I'll be doing my UKCC Level 2 mm. um, in the spring. Well, it's kind of, it's a six-month kind of thing, so spring-summer. So that will happen and there's something else that I'm about to do. Oh, I'm becoming a confidence coach. Cool. Yes. Hey, <laughs> remember. <laughs> there's, a, um, there's a wonderful woman called Kathy Syrett who's written this book and she coached me years and years ago and I've been using her methods consistently mm. because I'm a really nervous writer, mm. which is a very sensible thing because it's just my brain trying to keep me sick. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when she wrote the book and said she then needed a team of confidence coaches, I was like, pick me, pick me, mm. because... When people struggle to find their balance on a horse, they create all these muscular tensions, and mm. a lot of them are their subconscious is going, oh God, don't, don't die. die. Yes, yeah. try not to die. <laughs> I had this moment, I was teaching someone the other week, and yeah. I was like, we're going to take away our stirrups mm. and do some sitting trot. And she was like, last time I did this, I fell off. And I was like, it's going to be okay. Like, mm. we'll just do a few strides and then walk and then mm. a few strides. And she was like, she gripped with her knees and she tensed her body and oh, she was bouncing oh, up oh. and down and she was like, ah. and I was like, okay, walk. Now imagine that you're made of jelly. Mm-hmm. I was like, if you're a bit softer, you'll move with the horse and it'll be more comfortable mm-hmm. and you'll sit deeper and you'll be able to get your legs longer and it won't feel so bouncing. And she tried and she was like, oh, <laughs> like the moment of realization. And then she was just kept going and she kept going. And I was mm-hmm. like, how does that feel? And she's like, so much better. <laughs> so that is a great example of why I do body work and mm. the training because that's a clear example of rewiring a set of yeah. movement patterns that your subconscious has made you do because it made them feel safe. Mm. And it just made her feel safe because it prevented her from yeah. working without her stirrups. Yeah. So that's that's what I do for the horses. Yeah. But the confidence coaching, I just I need a few extra skills in mm. order to be able to really help the people let go of some of the fear. Mm. It just makes life more fun. Um, were there any particular horses that you've enjoyed working with the most? When I was in America, oh, so many of them. But I think my th- four favorites. <laughs> <laughs> so they have a gorgeous little 18 year old Arab who was, he's the one in the side range that comes to mind when I talk about that. And he's just, he's convinced that he's going to die if you ride him. So very few people ride him. He gets mm. used a lot for in hand lessons because he's a master at teaching that. Mm. But very few people get to ride him, and even fewer people ride him off the lunge line because mm. he can freak mm. uh and on my last ride on him we were going a serpentine where you go trot 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 half pass half pass posture mm. across it then piaf in the middle then change your half pass and back and it was just like you're the coolest horse i've ever oh. ridden because it's all there so long as you can just take the fire and just mm. gently pour some sand on it so that you come mm. back to ground yeah. um they have an amazing another rescue arab who just thinks it's really funny to passage <laughs> and not just like average passage but like passage like you're on a pogo stick and you might fly out of the saddle in <laughs> he's just hysterical he's his main aim is to make his riders giggle and once he's made you giggle he's like he just stands there really calm like brilliant job done you can give me a polo i'm going back to bed now <laughs> i love that a horse with a sense of humor is the, just the best thing so when his owner was first trying to get flying changes with him she couldn't get it and she couldn't mm. get it so she had less than one of the other school horses and she totally got it and he was watching from his stable because mm. their stables all mm. face into the arena and the next ride she got on him and he took off with her in a canter and went ding 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 sorry these my hands are doing changes mm. flying change flying change flying change there we go, <laughs> see i've learned how to do it i was just i didn't know what it was you wanted that sounds <laughs> really cool um my other favorite horse oh, would be oreo Mm. He was a young horse I was working with. He'd been brilliantly started in all of the forward stuff, the walk, mm. the trot, and the canter, mm. but he hadn't started any of the lateral work. Mm. And he's got some of the dodgiest conformation I've ever seen, <laughs> like cow hocks and splayed front legs. It's it's Bless. amazing. Um, the first time I rode him, it took me two laps of the arena and walk to find a stop. I could have pulled on the reins and made him stop, mm. but I'm looking for balancing him to a point where his skeleton feels like stopping is the thing mm. that will occur next. Two, two laps of really going, I can't stop this horse. <laughs> and he's pretty tall, he's 16 hands, he's just got mm. really long strides, you're walking pretty quick. Mm. But by my third ride, he spontaneously piaffed underneath me. He went, this this square thing we have been mm. exploring, 
you know, I could do this with it. And I was like, yes, you could, man. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, he was pretty good fun to work with too. Oh, you make it all sound so easy. <laughs> well, that's the thing though, it's actually, it's, there's no such thing as advanced riding. There is mm. just beginner riding done in more and more combinations. So yeah. once you have this, this thing we were talking about in the first episode, this feeling of touch, mm. it's a little bit like mirror hands. Have you ever played mirror hands? No. Okay. So all of the listeners at home and you two, put your hands up against each other. So you're like, no, no, with each other. You have to be a horse and a rider. So people at home, find somebody else to do this with, put your hands together, they're almost touching. I don't need to play this game. I've already done it. Um, and now Tess, you get to be the horse. Okay. Alex, you're going to be the rider. So yeah. Tess, move as if, just move a little bit from side to side. And Alex, you're going to follow her. <laughs> yeah, you're going to stick with her. <laughs> so as you guys get better at doing it, you'll find that you find kind of a harmony where you can keep the movement going. Yeah. Now, imagine that <laughs> one of you is a horse and one of you is a rider. But the control of the horse, it doesn't come from telling it what to do. The control arises <laughs> naturally. <laughs> These guys look okay, you can stop now. Maybe you need <laughs> the control of the horse, it comes out of the following. So the closer you can follow the horse, the mm. more that you harmonize with the horse, then the horse gets, you both mm. get addicted to this sensation of harmony where mm. you're just in that level of mental connection where you're mm. both smiling as you're doing it because it's mm. just fun. Yeah. And then you can influence you can just suddenly say, Well, what about if I move my hand slightly and give mm. you space to move into and the horse is like, Oh yeah. And suddenly you're cantering mm. from a halt. Mm. Uh, but it comes with all of this calm that that curious engagement that on our own yeah. thing that we mm. talked about it's different <laughs> from pushing a horse forward because the horse takes mm. you forward and i guess it's a little bit like our episode with kirsten wing yeah when we were talking about um, we were talking about what's so addictive about doing dressage yeah. and it's that feeling of a horse who's completely with you and completely like keen on the job and like you're coming across the diagonal in canter and the horse is like well what am i doing am i doing extended canter am i doing a flying change and it's just really ready to do whatever you want that is on avant that is mm. true forward yeah yeah mental mm. engagement so, okay cool so while you were in america because yes. we are planning a trip to america oh. at some point in the very far future at the moment <laughs> um did you get a chance to see the surrounding area while you were there i did so the kids were pretty clear that on my one day off it wasn't a day off at all mm. day off actually meant get up at 4 a.m and go and do something really cool with the mm. children <laughs> so we went whale watching oh, oh, so which cool. was really cool uh we went to canada for the day because if you're in of washington course. you're in like the top left hand corner of america like you Maybe might as well get another stamp in the passport yeah. so we went to canada for the day that was really cool mm. they have lots of beautiful mountains and mm. whilst i love riding in an arena I am actually an endurance rider. Mm. So it's nice to get out into the great outdoors. Mm. Um, the scenery is so big there. Like. It's amazing. So we went to, we went up one mountain range and then another day we went to another mountain range and mm. went to a temperate rainforest and mm. still went to a beach where there were pelicans, like in the space oh of God. like, yeah. And yeah. then we looked at the map and we looked at the map of the whole of America. And we're like, so we've covered roughly three millimeters of America. Mm. Yeah. And we've seen all of this amazing stuff. Yeah. So it's really cool. Just avoid the traffic in Seattle. That mm. sucks okay really well really done yeah um what is next for you next for me is just consolidating what i've done mm. teaching my horse to piaf by christmas teaching my mum's miniature shetland to piaf <laughs> <laughs> because i understand how instagram not? works now <laughs> yeah. if you have a ginger one-eyed miniature shetland this You're is this doing is very well stuff, <laughs> stuff the arab yeah does all the cool stuff already no we need to get the miniature you shetland need the fluff on the yeah exactly because he's, he's super cute so yeah, it's just training my own horses, training my clients' horses, helping more people discover how cool this stuff can be. And for people to watch Norman, we'll yes. go through your Instagram and your Facebook again. Yes, uh, it, I am at a holistic solution uh, and a holistic on solution on Facebook. Yeah. So and Norman the one I chat. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not going to give him his own feed yet because he might get more followers than me. <laughs> very real concern. <laughs> yeah, seriously, very real concern. Um, but I will make sure that I get some more photos of Norman the one I chat and pretty soon. Mm. and everyone hopefully everyone listening to this already follows us on instagram but if they don't we are at the pony podcast and we're the pony podcast on facebook and if you have any episodes that you want to request because we do do requests uh if you email the pony pod at gmail.com oh. i think yeah thanks so. oh and like rate and subscribe ideally five stars because it helps other people find the podcast mm -hmm. thanks guys <laughs> cool. all right bye bye